So Jamie, thank you so much for joining. So can you just give people a bit of background, just like what is Industrious? Um, how would you define the business and a little bit about how you came to start it? Um, so we're the largest premium workplace provider in the country. We're in, at this point, you know, 55 cities or so, more than 100 locations. Um, you know, we, uh, we, the very early days of the business were, were about saying, look, there's, there's a white space in the, in the workplace industry for a more professional, more elegant shared workplace product. That's like the really early days, you know, first two, three, four locations when me and my co-founder were still getting our feet on the ground for a very long time now, since, since quite early in the life of the business. I think the business has been driven largely by one core strategy that I think is pretty distinct from WeWork or Notel or Convene or a lot of other providers in the industry. That strategy is basically as much as possible acknowledging that this is a outsourcing industry, that this is, you know, you're going to companies and you're saying this thing that for the last 50 years you did yourself, the delivery of your employees workplace experience is something that you should let us do for you. Um, and learning from logistics outsourcing and fulfillment outsourcing and manufacturing and data storage and looking at all the ways in which those industries um, went from 1% of the market to 60, 70, 80% of the market. And I can elaborate on what that means in this sector, but I've found over time that that analog is not like it's not cute, it's not like a fun, or that's not that fun, but like, it's not just like a nice shorthand, it has actually really helped drive strategic decision making and has resulted in us running the business quite differently than, than sort of competitors or adjacent um, you know, providers have. And, and when you describe the business like that, I think a lot of people, like the, the kind of, the, the mass market understanding of co-working as a company yep. is kind of synonymized co-working with WeWork. And so yep. can you kind of maybe just help you yep. almost disambiguate co-working yep. versus WeWork versus industrious? Yeah. So if you start from the premise of you should let us deliver your employees workplace kind of for you, I think, and, and the value prop is that, you know, it's not just going to be faster and cheaper and, and more flexible and less operationally burdensome, but, but rather you are going to have more productive, more engaged employees. You are going to have lower employee attrition if you let us do this for you. And you can hold our feet to the fire. You can measure all of those things. And most big companies do measure employee engagement, stuff like that. And if we're not delivering, you should kick us to the curb. That is not what we work is out in the world pitching. That's not what we work is out in the world trying to do. I do think the commonality is for teams of 20 and below, if the premise is, hey, we're on the hook to deliver a better day at work for your employees, I think it's quite clear below 20 employees, you get a better employee outcome if you have private space for that team of 12, team of eight, team of six, but if it's integrated into a larger complex of shared amenities and shared experiences. You know, at 12 people, you're just not enough people to have focus rooms for when someone needs to write a four hour, you know, investment memo. You're not gonna have different space types for different interaction types and different types of work. And therefore- And Jamie, is ahead. that a sweet spot where you get the kind of economies of scale by virtue of just shared services? like? It's annoying with a team of 12 for someone to change the coffee, for someone to you know, erase the whiteboard, for someone to basically make a multifaceted office work because the scale is too small. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're saying? I would say for teams of 200 and above, there are no economies of scale and there isn't a lot of benefit from working with an expert provider. Most companies for a 400 person team can deliver a workplace as well as industrious can. I think the benefits of, of kind of consuming your workplace as a service start at about 200. The distinction to me is from 20 to 200, um, a lot of the benefits come from our expertise, from us running a lot of the things, et cetera, but it's mostly private space. For teams of 20 and below, 
that's where you start to really see benefits from lots of shared spaces in addition to private spaces. And that gets to kind of when someone closes their eyes and pictures co-working and pictures the shared lounges and the shared conference rooms and things like that, that portion of it, the very highly that where the, the sort of, there is private space where there's a lot of shared space that I think is best suited for teams of 20 and below. And, but, and how, yeah. how important in that is the aesthetic, right? Like I, I, I have a very clear, uh, impression in my mind of what it's like to walk into a WeWork. Yeah. Um, and I also have a very clear impression of what it's like to walk into an Industrious. And they are just fundamentally different aesthetics that, that spawn different kinds of creativity and um, you know, interplay between workers mm -hmm. in a company. Um, how would you define that and how important is that in terms of differentiating co-working from flex office and outsourcing, as you put it? I think there's two categories there. There's how important is aesthetics in the, in the individual company's ability to customize their own space so that it feels like McKinsey's space or feels like Twitter's space. And then in the shared amenities, how do you create an aesthetic that Exxon, a four person marketing team, Airbnb and Pfizer could all share and feel comfortable with, which is a, which is a complicated proposition. And so I would say the ideal aesthetic outcome is to have shared aesthetics of shared spaces that are comfortable and inviting and you could work in for five years without going crazy and that feel very much like a neutral palette. Like this is a beautiful place to work, but they're not shoving down my throat that it's an industrious. I should feel like this is Bain's Chicago offices and they happen to take advantage of sharing economy dynamic. It's like a white labeling almost. Yes. It's a outsourcing, but the brand, the consistency with other offices is maintained, is congruent for someone traveling from New York to San Francisco and going into a Bain industrious office in San Francisco. Is that how you think about yeah. it? Yeah, and I think where people have, where people sometimes I think find it confusing or is, I think the best way to do that is to have it be gorgeous, but a little bit neutral. You know, if, if industrious are accused of anything on the aesthetic front, people might call it a little boring. You know, where's the neon that you get in a WeWork or things like that? Sorry, let me just switch spots here. Um, where is the, you know, where is the crazy wallpaper? And over the years, we've found it's not what customers want. They want something gorgeous and inviting, but, but skewing a little bit, again, neutral, like a palette that they can paint their own brand on. I like the palette of your house, by the way. I just got a tour of it as you were twirling around. Um, it actually, it's interesting because when, um, one of the trends that we thought a lot about when we were looking at co-working was both the kind of huge secular tailwind behind Flex Office, which is companies are demanding greater levels of flexibility in terms of their real estate needs, but also about brand, right? Like brand is this, kind of odd concept for real estate. Because I feel like real estate has been so axiomatically driven by this idea like location, location, location. Meaning like, if you want to be in a given location, it doesn't matter who owns your building or who operates your building. It's just the location that matters. Yeah. The location is the brand, effectively. Yeah. And I feel like what companies like yours and WeWork in some ways pioneered was this kind of customer centricity. Like you cared about the customer um, and in caring about the customer, you developed your own brand around service, around outsourcing. Yeah. I guess when, when you explain that to a traditional landlord, yeah. how do they react to that? And I guess even a prior question is like, would you define that as being a real innovative part of what Industrious did? I think the way that I would talk about it with a landlord that that maybe sounds a little bit less self-congratulatory or we care about customers and traditional real estate didn't, is that there's a change happening in what the building represents to the tenant. Um, you know, before the, the, the tenant needs space, they need, they need, you know, they need an elevator and then the, the rest, they're on the hook for the rest. They have to figure out what the brand of the business should be. They have to figure out how, the, how to deliver their employees' experience day after day, what it should feel like, what the food and beverage should be, what the events should be, et cetera. I mean, that's, and on, the tenants. that's on the tenants. That's on the tenants. And yeah. in that circumstance, I don't think a building needs much of a brand. 
Like it, the landlords didn't make a mistake not doing that. I don't think that was tenant unfriendly in a world where the tenant only wanted space and they did the rest, then okay, then there really shouldn't be a brand. We're moving towards a world where the tenants are saying, I wanna buy my employees workplace experience as a product in the, in the industrious example, or even in the sort of midpoint, like more traditional real estate example, more and more people are saying, I need the building to be my partner in delivering my employees workplace experience. I need the building to have events at the building level. I need the building to have a personality. I need the building to help me with HR tracking and figuring out which employees are in the office and which ones aren't. And so as the building moves from being a static asset to being an integral part and a partner to companies in delivering their employees workplace needs, I think inevitably the building needs more of a brand and needs more of a positioning and industrious is just the most extreme high touch version of that. But what we're doing should be happening across commercial real estate if it's done right. Let me just ask an obvious question. Like, why did tenants start saying that to landlords? Like, what was it about yep. the yep. last 10 years where tenants started coming yep. to landlords and saying, I need to partner with you around the design of my space to optimize productivity yep. for my workforce? Why did that happen? I think uh, in, in certain ways, delivering a, like a, a, a strong kind of workplace experience for your employees has gotten more complicated, more complex, harder for a part-time office manager that's not a professional to do like, you know, well. And the Googles and the Facebooks and the sort of Twitters of the world in their headquarters made clear what an ultra thoughtfully designed, like very progressive, very customer or employee focused workplace looks and feels like. And if you walked into work in your 104 person sales office in Plano, Texas, you were so painfully aware of the way in which your office experience fell short of what was possible, that all of a sudden you had employees demanding more and more and more. And I think, you know, for most companies, they weren't or are not capable of doing that on their own. So I think the simplest answer is companies wanted to elevate the, the quality of what they were doing. The ability to do that was becoming more complex with more complicated technology needs with employees moving from working the office five days a week to traveling more and wanting, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And as that becomes more complicated, they need help, they need outside resources, they need a partner in crime in doing that. And I think that dynamic I just described is oftentimes what fuels the growth of outsourcing industries like manufacturing and logistics started to become outsourced at exactly the time where supply chains became more complicated, they became more global. And so for a random company to stitch together their own logistics network started to become more, less and less sort of like credible. I think it's less and less credible that Heineken could deliver an amazing workplace experience to a 62 person team in Tampa. It's so obvious they need help. Right. And, and I think a lot about that analogy, which I think is a great one in manufacturing, which is as you had higher levels of competition and higher levels of complexity in like these supply chains, companies realized they needed to outsource. And to some extent, it feels like for knowledge workers, right, which is what industrious caters to, the, the competitiveness among firms, the competition between Netflix and between yeah. Google and between Amazon for, you know, the best talent is so fierce that the workplace is one of the battlegrounds for that, like building that full service really engaging, really dynamic workplace is really important. And that is, as workers trend younger, as you have more of these millennial workers that care not just about money, but also purpose in their work, it seems like that aligns very well with, you gotta outsource it. Because it's very unlikely that, you know, in the case of Heineken, making the best beer is aligned and likely to coincide with making the best workplace in many different cities. Yeah, it's not a core competence of 99% of companies, nor should it be. But, you know, if you look at, like that is the dominant business strategy of the last 30 years for companies. Find the things that are not core to what you do, that are not, you know, the product you put out in the world and, um, and find an expert to kind of, to do it, to do it for you. Um, and I do think the war for talent and and the fact that employees' expectations, you know, have kind of gone up over time have 
probably illuminated or, or brought to the forefront when a company was failing to deliver that. I think part of it is also um, people know when they've had a really productive day at work. They like people know when it's like, that was just one of those days when I felt like I was on top of the world and people know when they put in 10 hours and got two hours of good work done. And I think every white collar worker is chasing the former. Like you, um, and I think there, there's an increasing recognition that it's not random. Like it does not just that you sleep well the night before, though that matters, the actual experience, what interactions you had, were you beset by distractions or able to focus, those things have an enormous impact on productivity. And it's not really about water slides and ping pong tables. It's about the interaction between the environment you spend your whole day in and how productive and engaged and focused you're able to be. Sure. And, and how do you think about conveying that success? So, you know, if, if workers are in fact leaving the office saying, wow, that was yeah. a really productive day. I feel like I got a lot yeah. accomplished and the yeah. environment and the ambiance and yeah. the dynamism of the office was a contributing factor to that. Yeah. How do you convey that? How do you convey success to the, to your client that look, your workers are more productive here than they are if you design your office space yourself? Um, so I think it's three things, uh, early in the life of the business, we didn't have data to support it. So we had to assert it. We had to say, walk around tour. Isn't it clear this would be a better place to work at this point? We've delivered 10 million days of work. It is helpful to be able to stand on outcomes. And to me, the three outcomes are, um, net promoter score, which is just, you know, your standard customer satisfaction. I think we're able to show, look, you know, the percentage of industrious customers who one to 10 would rate nine out of 10, nine or 10 out of 10 on, I would recommend this to a friend is extraordinary. It's, it's above an Apple, a Google, et cetera. It's in the sort of upper, upper echelon of B2C or B2B brands. And that's not random. Two, you can show subjective results on percentage of people who say they feel more productive or got more done working at an industrialist at their previous workplace, you know, that hangs around in the high 80s or low 90s. And for a lot of companies, their previous workplace was the Heineken delivered workplace. And so it's pretty clear what, you know, what the implication is. Um, and then I think the last piece is some outcome sort of metrics on employee attrition and things like that. Or you put one team in industrious. So if you're Spotify, you don't put 20 teams in an industrious. It's, it's, it's too big of a commitment. You put one team in and you check in in three months. And if all of your Spotify employees in Spotify Atlanta are like, this is amazing. I, I really prefer going to work here than where I've worked previously. Then you put Spotify Nashville in, then you put Spotify LA in. But there is, because of how close to the bone and important the industry is, there is a try before you buy kind of way of, of, of outsourcing workplace that I think is very healthy. And the, the other way that at least I think about industrious as being unique from this kind of synonym between we work and co-working is around business model, which I know is something yeah. you've thought a lot about. And business yeah. model more on the landlord facing side, which is yeah. when we were looking at co-working, um, you know, we identified, I think, what a lot of landlords identified very early on, which is you have this fundamental mismatch in the duration of your assets, these short-term leases, these very flexible leases, and your liabilities, these very long-term leases with the underlying landlord. Yes. And I feel like anyone who has studied even a little bit of financial history knows that a mismatch in the duration of your assets and, li and liabilities kills businesses over a long enough time frame. It's the cause of every major banking crisis we've ever been through. And we were like, well, this is really just a real estate articulation of that same problem. And what fascinated us so much about what you were doing was trying to find better alignment between landlord and industrious and the tenant and how that integrates into the building. Can you walk me through what that means, like what your management contract model means okay. philosophically, but then also how landlords interpret it? Yeah. Yeah, I think the way you just articulated the problem with the industry when we entered it, like that was succinct and clear and 100% true. 
And I think there are commodity industries like, you know, certain types of shipping where you really don't have a choice, you know, like that, that is, that's the nature of the game and those big spoons, booms and busts. And you just have to have like the guts to deal with those swings. This doesn't have to be that kind of industry. This is not a commodity industry. This is an ultra high value. Like if you're the best at delivering an employee experience to Airbnb or Merck, that's an incredibly high value product and partners should want to partner with you in delivering that. And I think we felt that from very early on. For our first 50 units, we had to prove it. We did have to go with the more sort of swingy, asset liability mismatch leased model in order to build a track record that said, look, we deliver 30, 40% above market NOI, and we can use what we do to transform the performance of the other 85% of the building if we directly control 15%. And given that, shouldn't we be partnering together to do that versus I pay you 30 bucks a square foot every year and, and kind of, you know, we, we sit at arm's length. And, and over time, what we have found is it's riskier in certain ways. I think it's different and landlords are quite conservative, but it's become so clear that to partner together, sit on the same side of the table and figure out how we can use what we do to transform the tenant experience of an entire building and deliver higher returns to a landlord, that that is something that I think there's a lot of appetite for. So you asked, well, let me pause. Does that make sense? I can walk into what the actual contract looks like. No, I don't think we need to walk into like we don't need to walk through the actual contract. I was just more interested in how how you came to that conclusion, which which in some ways strikes me as so intuitive. Because when we looked at these master leases, we were like, yeah. there is such a painfully obvious asymmetry here, insofar as the landlord has inherently capped upside, right? The fixed rent. Whatever you're paying under the lease, that is what the landlord can make. So the most successful industrious, the most successful we work, the most successful flex yep. office provider, there is no incremental upside beyond what's contracted under the lease. However, yep. there is very asymmetric downside. And I feel yes. like landlords are getting a uh, unhealthy dose of that realization right now as yep. Base is being given back to them, meaning it's a call option, basically a call option for the provider. How, I guess my question, Jamie, is that seems so obvious. Why, why was Industrious the first firm to really pioneer that? Is it because it was so challenging with landlords to evidence that symmetry? Or what was it that, that made that non-intuitive when it seems so obvious? I think it's intuitive. I think from the provider's point of view, one reality of being an entrepreneur, and I think this is true in, in, in a lot of businesses, is you kind of, you take the business you have and you have to make the best of it. And in the early days, we tried pitching management contracts. There wasn't much appetite. So you start signing leases and then you get so invested in convincing the world, like it's actually not that bad. Like it, here's why it's less risky than it looks and this or that. You, you kind of start to believe your own bullshit. Like I do think, and, and, and when you ask about, was there a moment or was there, you know, what, like, I, I think I was at a conference like three minutes into this like disquisition about why it was less risky than it sounds to sign leases with landlords. And I just was like, I felt like nauseous at some point. I'm just like, ugh, like instead of having to spend all day explaining away the biggest knock on our industry, like, why don't we take a shot one more time at solving it? But that's not that easy to do. I think usually when you have a business you, and, you, and you've had to spend a lot of time defending it, you get so deep in it, you can't zoom out and see like, oh, no, 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 this is not a great part of our business. So that I think on the, for, for WeWork and others, like why didn't they push harder to shift? I think once you've signed 100, 200 leases, it's too scary to go back to the market and say, wait, actually a lease is a bad form of doing this. Like your legacy portfolio is too, too substantial. You've made your bed, you have to lie in it. And it was very like, you know, it was, it was hard for us to, to switch. I think for landlords, I think they always got it. They just, you know, it's different and it's new and they have to go talk to lenders. And I think they needed hard, cold, hard numbers that proved that we make much higher than market rents in order to substantiate that and, and unlock it. 
Yeah. And what's, what's interesting is like the, the comment you made that landlords understood this in some ways well before Silicon Valley did. I think um, so. We sat in this, in this unique vantage point to actually see that because we would be having dialogue with venture capital funds who would be talking about we work as if it was wholly literally disruptive as a concept. Um, and we were like, well, no, actually it's not. This concept of you know flexible, shorter duration leases is actually like decades old. It's not altogether unique. What is unique is this concept of outsourcing, as you yeah. put it. And there are huge new secular tailwinds that, that are driving the demand yeah. for that. Um, but landlords were like, oh my gosh, we don't think this is going to end well, right? What's happening with WeWork? We've, we've seen this movie before with, you know, uh, corporate housing, and we've seen it with co-working, and we've seen it with, you know, other categories. And so it was an interesting position because while they were saying that, what you were saying when we first started our dialogue was so, in my mind, like refreshing. It was like, oh, yeah, of course a management contract makes sense. Why? Because landlords are in the business of taking risk on how yep. valuable space is. And they should be yep. capturing both that upside, but also that downside. Um, so and I think this law has been helpful. I mean, like you just said, it's intuitive, but it's different. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's different for an enormous asset class that has done things a certain way for a long time. And I have found over time, it's helpful to not be the lone voice in the room. Like, I think you guys have been pretty credible at kind of saying like, I don't know, from where we sit, certainly seems clear that in the long run, this industry is gonna move to management contracts. And when we say it, we're pitching a little bit. Whereas I think Fifth Wall has been able to be a little bit of a neutral arbiter, a little bit of someone, you know, where it's like, we're an investor, we look at the world, we see it as it is, and, and, and we do well when we're honest with ourselves about what it is and this is where we've come out and you can you know you x y or z kind of you know large global landlord can come to your own conclusion but this is this is what we've seen i think that's been that's been a powerful like part of the narrative um not to like flatter you but i, I i've seen that it's interesting i think just across real estate right real estate is this industry that it's like so big so idiosyncratic and because we spend so much time talking to other venture capitalists, we recognize that there is this tendency to lump things together because they seem to fit in the same like framing space, but have totally different business models. And frankly, Industrious is a perfect example of that. Because you know, today, if you were to say, oh, you know, how is Industrious doing? We're like, actually, quite well. Um, but they're like, well, what about WeWork? Right? There, there's, this, there's this misunderstanding of why business model matters so much. And I'll give another example of where that plays out. We're major investors in a company called Open Door. And I've heard venture capitalists be like, oh my gosh, that's so risky. You saw what happened to the subprime lenders, you know, in 07. And I'm like, what? Like, it, the fact that they both like are purveyors of housing and kind of yeah. in the housing market doesn't mean that their business models are in any way um, symmetric. They're, they're completely different. Um, so it's been a really unique position because real estate is so big, is so under technologized that I think there's this tendency in, in Silicon Valley, like I said, to lump these businesses together. And I think that's inappropriate because you miss opportunities around how business model nuance can massively de-risk and create value for new businesses like yourself. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's exactly right. And, but I think usually in an industry as you move up the value chain in business model as you move towards the more risk mitigated you know kind of more stable business model or the more capital efficient business model it's not totally random i think typically you have to be you have to have a better product you have to you know you have to you have to have lower churn you have to have higher pricing in order to effectuate that stronger business model usually i know that's like a very like mushy kind of like category level statement but i think that's true when when software businesses move from selling software to as a service when businesses move from kind of like 
they're they're taking all the risk to they're taking a fee stream or something oftentimes they it's because they're the strongest provider in their industry that they were able to make that jump and i do think for us it wasn't as simple as going out and asserting to the world like we built a better mousetrap because we decided people should do management contracts we had to fight for years and years to say we're really good at what we do and we have very consistent unit performance and therefore you should take a chance on what we can now all agree is a better business model. So let's switch gears a little bit and just talk about where, where the US office industry is um, and further downstream where kind of flex office is yep. as a function of the pandemic that we're in. It's August 28th right now, we've been here for six months. How I guess did you first react to what happened starting in March? And what insights have you gleaned looking forward? From the very early days of the pandemic, I think we had an intuitive sense that this was going to accelerate certain of the trends that are very much like fundamental to the growth of our industry. Um, and, and I think that has been borne out. You know, I know, there are some things that have surprised me, but overall, I think our perception has been, we are still one and a half percent of commercial real estate. Um, you know, our biggest competitor is not WeWork or Notel or anyone else. It's people continuing to do things the old way. Um, it's the legacy market in a certain way. And I think the biggest- Jimmy, I mean, can you unpack that a little bit when you say you're, you're one and a half percent of commercial real estate? Just what do you mean by that? I mean, our industry broadly, broadly defined. The, the workplace as a service versus workplace that I created and run and signed a long-term lease and deliver myself kind of legacy model. Our, our, our model is about under 2% of however you want to define it, square footage, number of employees in the US that work in our model versus the traditional model. It's something in that range. Um, and it's going to be 30 to 50% at some point. Um, and a lot of the question is what the slope of the line looks like, how fast companies make that shift. And I think the two biggest determinants of that are number one, how quickly they move from an ultra concentrated way of working where 80% of headcount works at a meta, mega headquarters to a more distributed model of lots of mid-size or even tiny offices spread across an entire country or spread across the globe. And the second is how quickly they roll off of like, you know, these long-term sort of traditional obligations they have and, and, and sort of move towards their stated intent of shifting their workplace portfolio. And the two things COVID has done is number one, has increased company appetite in almost every sector for a more distributed, more kind of employee choice driven way of working. And two, People are breaking leases, people are downsizing, people are moving out of the legacy market and into the as a service market. Um, and you know, those are those are it's it's different in different regions and it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's very clear those two things um, are are happening at an accelerated rate because of COVID. Can you can you unpack that word distributed and what you mean by that in in the context of where we are right now? Meaning I think of Distributed is, it can have two vectors. Um, one is distributed across the country or across the world, but in offices, or distributed into your own homes or some combination thereof. Like when you say distributed, what do you think that trend line looks like? Um, I think there was V1 distributed and V2. V1 was from the 1960s, early 70s until you know, a few years ago, that mostly meant instead of 80% of employees working in Armonk, you, you had more regionalization. You know, it went to 45% of headcount or 40% works at headquarters, and then you have a big LA office, a big New York office, but you know, these are still big internally run offices. I think V2, where what we're in now, has sort of bifurcated and, and is moving along two paths. One is a long tail of spoke offices. So rather than headquarters in Armonk and five regional offices, it's 60, you know, it, it's even within a city having an Alpharetta office, a downtown Atlanta office, 
and a you know Druid Hills office or something like that. And so the distri- the physical distribution across the country has accelerated. And then in any individual employee's life, instead of being like, I walk in and spend all day, every day at the same desk, the individual employee experience has started to distribute. So they work from home some days, they come into the headquarters some days, they go work out of their local no commute office some days. And even within the office, they work at their desk sometimes, they work in a focus room sometimes, they work in a huddle room sometimes. And so, you know, there's kind of, um, that is accelerating on both fronts. And both of those very much play into the as a service portion of the industry. It's extremely hard for even the most well-resourced companies to stand up 107, you know, mid-size or small national offices. And it's really hard for the average business to create an employee-driven, like, workplace model where employees get to choose where to work on any given day or on any given hour. Um, that's almost impossible to do without using a platform. And, and those two components of the, the breakdown of, like, traditionally what office meant, the first you described is kind of like a spoke model, right, which is many cities across the country that are just smaller yeah. scale than these yeah. big headquarters offices. Yeah. The way I think about that or a frame that I have to look at that through is, remember this concept of bring your own device to work, right? That you would, you know, yeah. bring your own Blackberry or bring your own iPhone yeah. or Android to work. And like, yeah. it was it was consumer choice in the form of employee choice, right? It was just yeah. a way of expressing yeah. the same thing, which is consumers can choose something that's equally functional, uh, complies with what the company cares about in the same way. So it's up to the employee. To some extent, it feels like what we're going through right now in the office market is that consumers can bring their own location to work, meaning yeah. it be yeah. your own location. You can decide to work out of Boise, you can decide to work out of New York. And yeah. what that does that I'm particularly interested in is like in the same way that bring your own device to work created high levels of competition from the device manufacturers. So once that happened, once large corporations shifted off BlackBerry and said, you can have an Apple, you can have a BlackBerry, you can have an Android. The competition among those hardware manufacturers got really intense. Yeah. You expect to see the same kind of competition between cities. So is now Salt Lake and Boise and Denver, are they in competition for knowledge workers who are going to bring their own location to their companies? in a way that they never were before. And how does that play out? I think that's exactly right. I love that analogy. And I think people are so aware of that. You know, you don't get to pick the high school you go to and lo and behold, they're not particularly nicely designed and they're not very focused on student experience. You get to pick what college to go to and they go nuts trying to create the perfect student activity center. And the you know, like you, when someone gets to vote with their feet, inevitably you see enormous rises in quality and in competition for that vote, essentially. And I think as we move towards something from a coercive model of working, where if you want to work at IBM, this is what you have to do to putting the choice in employees' hands, I think you're going to see competition among cities, competition among neighborhoods, competition among workplace providers to say, Like you get to construct your own life. You get to construct where you want to be, how you spend your days. And that means we want to be a place you choose rather than a place that you have to go to. Um, And I do think the Boise's, the Asheville's, the, you know, kind of, you know, Bozeman's are going to be net beneficiaries of it. And at the next level up, the Denver's, the Nashville's, the Austin's are going to be as well. It's interesting that you use the term coercive model of work, which <laughs> you know, too pejorative, but no, but it actually feels true, right? Like if um, if you want, if you're young and you want to work in the finance industry, it's yeah. almost coercive from your employer that you be in New York. Or yeah. conversely, if you want to work in the energy sector, it's drawn to Houston. Or if you want to work in the tech and innovation yeah. economy, you're drawn to yeah. San Francisco. But with this kind of knowledge worker great migration or scattering that's happening, it feels like that draw is is less profound. And so, you know, choosing your own lifestyle, choosing your own location, um, 
decreases the grip that cities like in particular San Francisco and New York had on a particular genre of knowledge worker, a particular archetype of knowledge worker. And what, what consequence, this is totally outside of the scope of industrious, but yeah. long term, what consequence does that have on cities like New York and San Francisco that are so premised on drawing a particular kind of worker to that location? And by the way, in turn have uh, adverse consequences from that. How San Francisco has one of the worst housing crises of yep. any city in the U.S. because of that draw, because the city isn't big enough to accommodate the demand for those kind of knowledge workers for yep. space to work there and to yep. live. I mean, I think of it a little bit like as a consumer, you you see this play out with products all the time. Like there is a product that's better. It's just better. And so everyone starts flocking to it, but then it becomes inevitable. Then it's like, if you're gonna have, you know, whatever, if you're gonna have a computer, it's gotta be a Windows computer. And over time, there's a slowing of innovation. You start to rest on your laurels and you start to focus more on extracting your natural advantages than continuing to be the place or the product everyone would wanna use. And the same way, you know, it's not random that San Francisco and New York became the places people needed to go to. They were the most vibrant cities. San Francisco had an incredible quality of life, an incredible amount of creativity, the most beautiful natural setting a city could have. New York was the most vibrant place on earth. And I don't think it did New York much of a favor to make that all of a sudden people who didn't want to be there and didn't want to spend the money had to be there or else they couldn't move up in the investment banking world. I mean, maybe this is the optimist in me, but part of me feels like if you move back to a choice-based model, you get back to the heart of what made San Francisco, San Francisco, and made New York, New York. And like, you know, again, I think people are going to, you, you, people are going to choose those cities. You are able to say, you know, kind of like, in certain ways, let's get back to why every company, why so many companies chose to base themselves in New York if they wanted the best knowledge workers in the country in the first place, rather than just assuming that's gonna be the case and again, kind of coercing them to do so. Yeah. I live in New York, I'm, I, I, I suspect that we will stay even if my job didn't require me to, because I think it's a really wonderful place to live in certain ways and hopefully the like, more problematic elements of it are gonna to start to recede a, a little bit or it'll start to democratize a bit more. And I guess this is a transition to the second part of my question, which is now, you know, the the dichotomy between working from an office and working from home, because yeah. um, you think about, you know, why cities formed in the first place. And it was because commerce, you know, human commerce had to happen in, in proximity to one another, right? Yeah. The trading of goods and services actually had to yeah. take place in physical space. But you know, the, the US economy has shifted from a, a production economy to a knowledge worker yeah. economy. And the economy now happens indoors, largely, yeah. in electronic devices, which are portable. And yeah. so as we shift to being able to work from home, which it sounds like we're both doing effectively right yeah. now, I think pretty well, do you think that the line between office space and this framing we're in right now of being in Zoom starts to blend? And do you think industrious has a role to play in that? Meaning there's, a, there's an alignment between the experience offline and the experience online. And I'll just give an example of kind of what I mean by that. I've seen a lot of people, um, when I get on a Zoom call with them, they put on they put up some background that basically has like the company logo in it. Yeah. And I'm like, this is a V1 version of yes. the work, the virtual workplace of the future will look like that actually the environments digitally will look and feel like the environments physically. How do we yeah. collapse those two things? I think, I think one of the most important elements of that is and this is gonna be more true post-vaccine, but um, right now there's a very clear bifurcation. You're either at the office or you're at home. Um, companies are choosing between we're a work from home company or we're, we're work from the office company. And that creates this kind of like very clear division. I think what we're moving towards 
and, and what obviously industrious sits at the heart of is something again, much more ambiguous. It's like, I'm gonna work from home for the morning, I'm gonna pop into this meeting at this conference room in the afternoon, I'm gonna go work at the wing on Tuesday because I'm, I'm kind of in brainstorming day, I'm gonna hang out with a bunch of colleagues at lunch, you know, whatever it is. And as home becomes one of seven, 10 different spaces that like stitch together form your work week, um, then I think there's less of like, we need to create digital backgrounds that anchor us back to the space that represents our workplace. Because over the course of five years, we'll shift to a mentality where the workplace isn't a thing and we need to like, you know, kind of have all roads lead to Rome, including our digital Zoom backgrounds, but rather the workplace or, or work will be something lived and done across a really wide variety of spaces. And it's okay if sometimes that's the wallpaper in your living room and sometimes that's a cafe and sometimes that's an outdoor conference room or this or that. That's my gut more so than that we are gonna to have to use digital experiences to like converge or recreate some existing thing. Um, but there are challenges. Like I do think to do that well, um, you know, bring your own location to your point meaning not just Boise, but in any given moment in time, you pick where to be. Um, it, does need to, it does need to be less clear who's in the room, who's not in the room, who's got good internet, who, who, does, who doesn't to, to make that work. Yeah, and, and in some ways it, it feels like there's a, there's a very similar story that feels maybe five to 10 years ahead of where virtual work is moving that happened in e-commerce, right? Yeah. Um, you can think yeah. about, you know, a e-commerce company's web page as being an online physical store. You would go into the physical store, you would see yeah. products, you would shop those products, you'd get some dimensions. You could, in some cases, even like quasi try them on. You had these, you know, yeah. programs that would let you assess a bit. But what it seems like has happened is that in the last five years, um, there's been so little differentiation across these e-commerce yeah. companies they've been compelled to go offline. So meaning at the same time retail rents are falling, demand actually for offline space from companies that were born online, these digitally native brands, has been increasing. Do you think that we're likely to go through the same kind of uh, over rotation in office where everyone will rotate towards a virtual environment and then very rapidly we'll realize, well, something's lost, culture is lost, yeah. training is lost, mentorship is lost and then there'll be this correspondent shift back. Is that likely to occur in office, you think? I think so, and I think I will, like, can draw from, when, I, when, when, when my co-founder and I launched Industrious, I was actually running a, a higher education organization, and higher education is a really good analog to this, in part because you can measure outcomes, you can measure graduation rates, more so than with work, you can measure, you know, there's the, the collegiate learning assessment that can actually measure gains in critical thinking, et cetera. And I think what has become very clear is an all-in-person education experience has pretty good outcomes. Let's say seven out of 10. Like if you take San Jose State, their intro to engineering course, that has about a 70, you know, 60 something percent passage rate in, in an all-in-person environment. All online is terrible. If all in person is a seven out of 10, all online, you know, University of Phoenix, for example, it's not like they have a 65% graduation rate, they have an 8% graduation rate. Like it's, it is so clear, it can't be done all online. The data is overwhelmingly obvious. But a hybrid model where you watch lectures, you know, at night online, and then you sometimes meet with classmates to work through problems. And when San Jose State, for example, experimented with that, with their intro to engineering course, the passage rate went from 60 something percent to 91%. Um, and so in the same way, I think people will find that a work, work day or a work week that is a combination of solo digital work where they're not around anyone else and then in-person mixed sort of experiences, it's, it's extremely unlikely to me that you would see those kind of outcomes in the education space and that's not true in your work life. It's not that different, you know, like, and so I think it'll be exactly, I think the retail examples um, 
a really a, like another classic example of that. Yeah, it's omnichannel, right? It, it, kind of what you're saying is that education is in some ways best done omnichannel. It provides the flexibility for the consumer of whatever it is to have choice in yeah. whether they want to take a class yeah. online, but then meet with the professor offline and yeah. they, that kind of alignment. The same thing happens in retail. All these new digitally native brands that are very rapidly opening up stores are recognizing that there's something about discovering a brand online, yeah. trying on products offline, and then maybe ultimately buying them online again that leads to higher customer retention. And it feels like for, for corporations, yeah. retention and satisfaction of employees is going to be driven around expanding the aperture of choice, right? And around I, guess I would finish by saying this, like not to sound too libertarian about it or, you know, but like um, omni-channel works in part because people are very good at knowing what they want. When you put choice in the consumer's hands, you know, there might be some wonkiness, but in, you know, over time, people are amazing at knowing, well, like for pants, they don't fit as cleanly. So I kind of need to go in person and try it out. But for a t-shirt that I can probably order online. And, and I think in those ways, when you kind of try to have a command and control top down, this is how you're going to work. You will have less productive employees than when you say there's options, there's work from home, there's bring your laptop to the park, there's whatever, and you get to decide where do you write memos best? Where do you brainstorm best? Where do you like respond to like annoying emails you just have to get through best? That sort of like choice-based framework almost always produces better outcomes because over time people are actually very intuitive and very good at like figuring out what works best for them, but you have to give them the choices to choose between. Yeah, and companies are going to have to figure out the instruments, the apparatuses to just enable employees to maximize those choices they're making. And it does, to me, feel very obvious that outsourcing yeah. and almost miniaturizing your yeah. office spaces yeah. across the country, within a city, is just obvious. It's obvious that that is where demand is going to trend from corporates for physical space. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I mean, you know, maybe Google and Apple, but in general, 99.9% .9 of American businesses, it would be so prohibitively expensive and bizarre to try to deliver this choice-based sort of network of spaces all internally. I don't even know what it would look like. Like you'd have to stand up so many spaces. Using the analogy of like, you know, bring your own device. It would be as bizarre as, you know, Goldman Sachs developing their yes. own device right? <laughs> yeah. that, that their employees yeah. can use to communicate yeah. over email. Yeah. It makes as little sense as that. Yeah. Um, Very good. That's kind of where I was going with it is that like, it feels like we are by virtue of what COVID has thrust on companies and real estate owners. It feels like we're just now reckoning with some of these big questions, which is there is value to specialization. And that applies to devices, that applies to consumer choice around locations, but that also applies to the physical environments in which knowledge workers come together. Um, yeah. To be honest, that's why we're so excited about Industrious and, and what you're doing, because I think you're doing that in a way that aligns with landlords and can almost educate and transition those landlords into that future state. Um, so. Yeah. That's my plug for Industrious because we're such big fans. But um, I loved this conversation. This has been yeah. really gaming. Um, yeah. The second half really got, I, I think you did a really good job of taking us to some sort of, I thought at first quirky, but just like really thought provoking places. Um, yeah. well, we should uh, do it again. <laughs> yeah, real deal, real. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. Yeah. Bye.